minutes after the clock struck 4 a.m. in the little mining town of Frank, Alberta. The residents of that town had an unexpected rendezvous with destiny. In 100 incredible seconds of wind, rock, and dust, a mighty, cruel, and relentless avalanche buried men, women, and children. Most of them were asleep and had no time to awaken. Those who were awake never knew what was happening. It is written. This is Mark Finley, presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today on this Canadian It Is Written telecast, my associate Henry Feyerobin presents Screaming Juggernauts. A book describing the Frank Slide disaster compares it to a screaming juggernaut. Where do we get the term juggernaut? My dictionary describes it as an overpowering and terrible force that crushes everything in its path. The word comes from the name of a Hindu idol, Jagannatha, meaning Lord of the World. Jagannatha is a 45-foot high wooden image supposed to contain the ashes of Krishna. It is housed on a 192-foot high temple built in the 12th century. Each summer, the idol is mounted on a huge unwieldy cart dragged through the sands to a country home about a mile away. Stories are told of pilgrims who threw themselves into the path of the cart, thinking that being crushed under its wheels would ensure them a happy afterlife. Juggernaut is a good term to describe the 90 million ton wall of rock that careened down the slope of the mountain and roared through the sleeping community of Frank the night of April 29, 1903. The evening before, the sun had set on a peaceful scene. None of those people had any inkling of the danger lurking in the mountain above them or the coming catastrophe. Most of the inhabitants of the town had gone to bed fully expecting to awaken another day. That little town with its wooden sidewalks, dirt road, hitching posts, and false front buildings resembled a town from the Old West. Destiny had gathered people from many different places to find employment in the mines. They didn't realize that they had been gathered for a rendezvous with death. It isn't as if they hadn't been warned. The Indians had long been suspicious of Turtle Mountain. They called it the mountain that walked. But human beings, whether on a battlefield or in a boat without a life jacket, refuse to believe that disaster can happen to us. We're too gullible. We always like to think that it's the other person who will die in a car wreck, that it's someone else's home that will be burglarized, that only other people who smoke cigarettes will die of lung cancer. We refuse to visualize ourselves in such unacceptable situations. The people of Frank had heard what the Indians said, but they didn't really expect the mountain to walk. And so it was, while the unsuspecting inhabitants of Frank slept, completely unaware of what was happening far above. In the darkness of the night, a boulder shivered, fell forward, then gaining momentum, rolled down the heavily wooded mountain as if impelled by some invisible force. This caused other rocks to begin to roll, and within moments, the whole mountain seemed to be falling. A cruel and relentless avalanche weighing 90 million tons broke away from that mountain, raced downward toward the town with its unsuspecting inhabitants. Within a hundred seconds, it was all over, and the cascade of rocks had gone through the valley and was climbing the slope on the opposite side. I'll never forget the first time I drove through the Crow's Nest Pass in Alberta. Many times since I've stood on those huge boulders, grim reminders of what can happen, giant tombstones that mark the site where people were taken completely by surprise. That cascade of death still lies like an enormous scar across the valley, a solemn reminder of the mountain that walked. We live in an unstable world, a world full of walking mountains and screaming juggernauts. Galileo said, no, the world is not a fixed body, it moves. And the scientific world has come to accept his conclusion. But when they read the words of St. Peter telling us that this world as we know it shall soon be dissolved, they're not so sure. They're ready to believe the astronomer, but they doubt the apostle. St. Peter said, 
in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. In spite of the warnings, some still count on the stability of the quicksand of this earth. More than ever, we're surrounded by walking mountains and screaming juggernauts. In the recent past, you and I have been spectators to some of the most sudden and awesome events in history. Just a short time ago, the world was spellbound by a general secretary of the Soviet Union who conducted a public relations campaign that would make Madison Avenue blush. Vast crowds in America, West Germany, England, France, and Italy were overtaken with Gorby mania. An article in the New York Times, April 27, 1990, said, Mr. Gorbachev has probably made greater contributions to the well-being of humankind than any other political figure in history. Who would have thought that within less than two years, even the Kremlin, his last stronghold, Gorbachev's third floor presidential office would be surrendered to his rival. After visiting Gorbachev, Yeltsin said, It's over. This is the last time I will go and see him. You mean now he will have to come and see you, someone asked? What for, retorted Yeltsin. Maybe for his pension check. When asked where Gorbachev had made his mistake, Yeltsin said he wanted to combine things that can't be combined to marry a hedgehog with a grass snake, communism and a market economy. We've observed the final dying gasps of communism as the capitalist world has buried its most mortal foe. The comfort we receive from seeing the superpowers cutting their nuclear arsenals is offset by the knowledge that eight other nations now have the bomb, and four countries that might be considered renegades, Iraq, Libya, North Korea, and Iran, are dangerously close to joining the nuclear weapons club. Vatican writer Malachi Martin, in his book, The Keys of This Blood, describes some of the mountains on the map of humanity, mountains that are about to come crashing down on us. He says that the most active volcano in our midst is formed by the greater part of our human family, which can be said to go to bed hungry and wake up miserable with no hope today, tomorrow, or next year. He says those mountains will either be reduced by our willingness to, to change or by the very weight of their own misery come crashing down upon all our hopes as human beings, shattering all our selfish visions of the good life and burying in their rubble whatever peace we might have thought to fashion in our single-minded rush to development. A professor of European studies was recently asked why he and his colleagues appeared untroubled by their failure to predict any of the monumental changes in Eastern Europe. He replied that the members of his profession were quite satisfied if they could predict the past. Only God's Word gives us certainty about the future of our planet. Bible students see no need to tremble when surrounded by screaming juggernauts and walking mountains. Look at the words of Jesus that we find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 and 26. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken an unerring forecast of what is happening around us, wouldn't you say? Sounds like the headlines of our times. But fortunately, God's Word doesn't stop there. It never presents a problem without a solution. Notice the next words in verses 27 and 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Screaming juggernauts have never intimidated true Christians. 
The tyrant may burn Christian martyrs at the stake or cast them into prison, but pure truth of Jesus is neither consumed by fire nor bound with chains. Churches have been destroyed, but Christianity has not been shaken. Their devotion doesn't hover around an earthly shrine. They can worship God just as well in a barn as in a basilica. Christians have worshipped Him in catacombs as well as in cathedrals. What advantage does a believer in God have over those who ignore the warnings of Scripture? It's always been God's plan to warn human beings of the events that affect them in their future. Thousands of years ago, we were warned that the last days would be a time of natural disaster. Back in Old Testament times, the city of Nineveh was warned about threatened destruction. But as Jonah went to that city to give them the warning they had received, they took it seriously. They repented of their sins, and God gave them another chance. Sodom and Gomorrah were warned about their coming destruction. They ignored the warnings, and it was the last night on earth for them. The antediluvian world was warned by Noah's 120 years of preaching that a flood was coming. But like Sodom and Gomorrah, they ignored the warnings, and the Bible says the flood came and took them all away, Matthew 24, 39. Throughout the Old Testament scriptures, the Bible pointed toward Christ's first coming. The scriptural message was, He's coming. God's Lamb is coming to bear man's sin. And when Jesus came, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, John 1, Just before sharing with you one of the most fascinating promises in the Bible, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about a book that I've found most helpful. I was just a boy when I first heard George Vandeman speak. I never forgot his intriguing presentations. He was the founder of the It Is Written telecast and has been its director and host for more than 30 years. His new book, Decade of Destiny, contains vital information for the issues that all of us are facing in the 90s. And you can have this book as a gift from me by simply calling our toll-free number. Now, back to the promise we were discussing. The Bible is full of predictions about the second coming of Christ. There's not a shadow of doubt concerning His promise to come back again. The modern preachers may not talk much about it, but Jesus was the greatest preacher that ever walked on this earth. And He said in John 14, verses 1 to 3, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. <laughs> Nothing ambiguous about that promise. He was here once. The historical record in the Gospels and the Epistles is certain about that. And He said, I will come again. Now, Jesus was accused of being an imposter. He was accused of blasphemy, but He was never accused of being a hypocrite, not even by His enemies. That was one charge that could never be leveled against him, not even falsely. Jesus never lied and was never known to exaggerate. He never broke a promise. He promised to come back again, and that's all the evidence we need. He is coming back. At a certain court case, a lawyer told the judge that his client couldn't be present in the courtroom. The judge became very angry and irritated that the person was absent. He growled at the lawyer, Can you give me three good reasons why this person is not here? Yes, said the lawyer. In the first place, he died this morning. In the second place, stop, said the judge. You don't need any more reasons. Your first reason's good enough. The fact that Jesus promised to come again would be enough. I would need no more proof, but there are many other reasons to believe. For every 20 verses in the New Testament, one talks about the second coming. It's mentioned 318 times in the 260 chapters of the New Testament. We have the promise of Jesus. We also have the testimony of the angels, which is found in the book of Acts, Acts 1, 9 to 11. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The angels not only told the disciples that Jesus would come, but they told him how he would come. No secret coming. It's a public appearance, and every eye shall see him. The book of Revelation confirms this. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, we have these words. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so Amen. Paul describes his coming like this. We find it in 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. <laughs> this is one of the noisiest verses in the Bible. You wouldn't use the blast of a trumpet for something secret, and you can't shout quietly. We have here the greatest public event in all history. Peter believed that Jesus, that God will send Jesus back into this world. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, he says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Both Peter and Paul looked forward to Christ's second coming. What about John? The beloved disciple ends the book of Revelation with a promise and a prayer. We find it in Revelation 22:20. 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Is that your prayer? You know, some people don't want him to come. A young preacher was holding a series of meetings in the South. One night, after he preached a sermon on the second coming of Jesus, an elderly woman came up and said to him, Young man, I was a Christian long before you were born, and I'm just as good a Christian as you are. I don't doubt that at all, said the young preacher. I love the Lord Jesus Christ as much as you do, continued the lady. I can't deny that, responded the young man. Then she said, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart, but I don't want him to come back in my day. There was something wrong with the love of that woman. Did the other disciples believe in the imminent return of Jesus? Listen to what James said in James chapter 5 and verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. We have the testimony of Christ, the angels, Paul, Peter, and James. To those we add the words of Jude in Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. I believe with all my heart that we are standing on the threshold of what the Bible calls Armageddon. We're witnessing great and solemn events. Prophecies are fast fulfilling. Strange, eventful history is happening before our very eyes. Everything in the world is in agitation. There's one thing that's more important than anything else to everyone here. Jesus says in Matthew 24, Matthew 24, 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. I remember hearing the story of a young man who was called to leave his pretty young bride and serve in the United States Army. He was shipped overseas, and for months... The young lady didn't know where he was. After anxious months of waiting, a letter finally came from the South Pacific. I cannot tell you the island we're on, but it's hot here. I can't tell you whether we are north or south of the equator, but the enemy is here. We're having a hard time, darling. Oh, how, how I wish I could hear from you. Please pray for me. 
as the young wife waited to hear from him, news of the war reached her. She read of great invasions, bloody battles. She saw war pictures that made her shudder. Could he possibly be in that mass of broken flesh? Could he be there with his face buried in the sand? She prayed long and hard for her lover. How excited she was when finally she got another letter. I'm safe and well. The worst of the battle is over, the letter said. How she enjoyed that letter. She waited for the postman every day, anxiously hoping to hear his footsteps come down the wooded walk to the front door with a letter. She would run to meet him. One day he brought her a parcel and a letter. She tore the box open and looked at the present, trying to read the letter at the same time. A few days later, she heard footsteps coming up the walk. But it wasn't the postman's footsteps. She knew that step, for love's ears are keen. It was his footstep. She was out the door in a moment and in his arms. She left the present. She left the letters. Now she was with him. How I love to read the letter Jesus has sent us, his holy word, the Bible. He has sent us marvelous presents, the gift of salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But very soon he will come to take us home, and then we'll forget everything else for the joy of being with him. We need to look forward to that marvelous day. Jesus has told us, I'm coming back. And he didn't say it to delude us or to deceive us. He'd never make a promise like that and then go away forever and leave us alone eternally. <laughs> He's coming back soon. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Listen to this. Oh, when shall I see Jesus and pray with him above? And shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning? And from the flowing fountain drink everlasting love. pray. Dear Father of us all, current events reveal the instability of the world around us. Amid the agitation and turmoil, we look to you claiming your promises to us. How we long for your coming. Please come soon and take us home. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
We know the difficult days lie ahead. The showdown at Armageddon will be very, very real. Middle East conflicts and climactic Bible prophecies are something we need to study and understand. Today we have a special book for you, Decade of Destiny. This book written by George Vandeman, who has served as the speaker of It Is Written television series for more than 30 years, is just what you need to understand the explosive issues of our decade. Here are some of the chapter titles. Decade of Destiny, Pornography's Fatal Attraction, The Truth About AIDS, and The New Age Conspiracy. Decade of Destiny is a free gift to you. Now here is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request today's free gift offer by calling our Canadian national toll-free number 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, 1-800-253-3000. Remember, your gift is sent free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the gift you're requesting. Call toll-free now from anywhere in Canada, one 800 253-3000. Lines are open 24 hours daily. Or, if you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. And thank you for your letters, your prayer requests, and your generous financial support. Write It Is Written, Box 2010, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. I've enjoyed spending this time with you. Mark and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <laughs>